The great crowd that had gathered heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd praised him, celebrated his miracles, and with great expectation told everyone about him. But they did not know him. They were waiting for someone who would rule with strength and might, but he came as a humble servant. They were expecting a general who would crush their enemies, but he came saying, love your enemies. They wanted him to finally bring their people glory, but he wanted to change them so their lives would bring God glory. They would soon realize that Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted, and they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. And as they yelled, Crucify! Pilate asked Jesus, Are you a king? Jesus answered, I am not that kind of king. His kingdom isn't what you see here. It won't be established by chaos and war. His kingdom is in our hearts. His kingdom is righteousness, forgiveness, and love. Today, we lift our voices. We cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Come dwell in our hearts, Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Can we give Jesus a hand this morning? Can we do that? Amen. Jesus was not what they wanted, but they failed to see he was exactly what they needed. Amen. Hey, we are, uh, me, I am so glad you're here. It is so good to see your faces this morning. If you're watching online, so great to have you with us. Uh, yesterday, as, <coughs> excuse me, the winds picked up. I don't know what it is. It feels like we live in the Midwest, right? I thought we lived in Pennsylvania. And, uh, my power went out at home, and we're uh, going through a group chat at church, and we're like, oh, no, here we go again. We're going to have to make arrangements for today. <coughs> Excuse me, but thank the Lord we have power and water. Amen. All right. Hey, if you have your Bibles this morning or an app, would you join me and go to Matthew chapter 21? Matthew 21. <coughs> we're not going to have it on the screen there. A couple other verses, but not this one in particular. Uh, so make sure you're looking at it. Um, I know version is a great app on our phones. There's other ones as well. But I don't even know what they are. I'm told there's other ones. But uh, Matthew chapter 21, and then kind of put a finger there and jump to Luke chapter 19. We're going to uh, look at that briefly as well, Luke chapter 19. Uh, again, as we mention all the time, if you uh, do not have a Bible, we want you to have a copy of God's Word. We have copies in the back at the Connect Center. Please take one. And as always, there is one uh, thing that we ask, do not leave it closed. Open that thing. Look at it. Read it. That is very, very important. And so we want everybody to have a copy of God's holy word. We're looking at the triumphal entry. Today is Palm Sunday. As Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, all four gospels speak of this uh, through four different perspectives. That's what I love as we learn more about uh, the gospels and the writers of the gospels. All of it all of it is true, 100% true. It does not contradict anything. Nothing contradicts itself. But each of these writers are seeing it from different perspectives. The Holy Spirit is, is inspiring them to write this, and some include some things, some don't include other things. We'll see some of that here this morning, but it is all inspired by the Holy Spirit and for Jesus. All of this is for him and for his glory, right? So as we dive into God's word, would you join me as we, we pray again? Uh, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your word, your holy word, full of power and truth and life. And uh, Lord, we, we pray and continue to pray for so many across the planet who do not have a copy of it. And there's organizations and people efforting daily to get your word into the hands of everyone. Every nation would see and have the opportunity to read and learn about you, Lord. So we don't want to take it lightly, ever. And thank you, Lord, for it. And as we open it up this morning, 
Oh, Lord, would your Holy Spirit work? We need more of your Spirit today. Here in this place and every home that's represented today, Lord Jesus, would your Spirit reign. Speak to us, Lord. Teach us, Father. Convict us, Lord. Draw us close to you. Lord, if there's anybody here or watching that does not have a personal relationship with you, oh, would this be their day? They would receive you as the King of Kings as the Lord of Lords, as the Christ, the Messiah, Savior. We pray all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, as we uh, look at Matthew 21, this is Jesus, again, entering into Jerusalem. This will be the final time. Uh, He's coming into Jerusalem for the final time. We know from the Gospels that he celebrated the Passover three times, which is really the the main... uh, reason why we know that his earthly ministry was roughly three and a half years. Uh, And so he's coming there for the last time. He's coming to be the sacrifice. He is coming to be what everybody needed, which is the sacrifice. Sin had separated them, and it continues to do so today. He is the one that gives us redemption. He is the one that saves us. He is the one that gives us hope of glory, which is with, with God in his heaven. Right? And so that's where we're at. Let's read uh, the first 11 verses together. Matthew chapter 21, follow with me. It says, And they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And again, we know that Matthew purposes to uh, connect the Old Testament with the New Testament, right? He's reaching Jews. He's trying to reach Jews. He he wants them to see that this is all connected. There's not a a disconnect. So here he quotes Zechariah 9.9. It says in verse 5, Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road uh, with other, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest Heaven Again, Matthew is connecting Psalm 118 here. Verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Some, put some things in perspective, and as we talk through this, I want you to kind of put yourself there. I know that's hard. Uh, if you have been to the Holy Land, you, then you probably are able to do this fairly easily, or at least easier than most. But just try to imagine what this must have been like as Jesus and his disciples are getting ready to enter into Jerusalem. So we get a kind of little geography lesson here. Uh, Bethphage was located on the Mount of Olives. We're not sure exactly where, but it was located on the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives were a group of hills just overlooking Jerusalem. Depending where you were at, it was a short walk down into Jerusalem, less than two miles. And as you kind of look at it on a map, you had Jericho, and then you had uh, Bethany, and the Mount of Olives, and and Jerusalem all kind of right there. We'll learn a little bit more about that here in a second, but all kind of, you know, you could could walk it. We wouldn't want to do that today because we're spoiled. We have vehicles that, when they work, get us to where we need to go, but uh, we wouldn't do as much walking. Back then, you you walked for sure. So uh, that's where we are. Now, um, separated... uh, um, Bethphage and Jerusalem were separated by the Kindred Valley. And we know this to be a place of mourning. We know this to be a place of death, a place of persecution. We read in the Old Testament and the New, people who've crossed over it for a variety of reasons, mainly in a negative sense. Jesus passed by there uh, many times. So it, it, it really had a, a reputation of judgment and sorrow and death. But praise be to God as he speaks through his prophet Jeremiah In Jeremiah 31, a day is coming when this region will lose that reputation. And God will allow his son to come back, and it'll be holy to the Lord. And so we know that Bethphage is located uh, on the Mount of Olives. Now, 
we read that Je- Jesus is coming up from Jericho. Jericho was roughly 1,000 feet below uh, sea level, all right? The Mount of Olives was roughly 2,500 feet above sea level. So Jesus and his disciples are walking through this windy road, roughly 16 to 18 miles, uh, up 3,500 feet to get to the, the peak. So uh, you had to be in shape, right? This is like when the Iron Man started right here. This is part of the Iron Man back in Jesus' day. Uh, you had to be in shape to, uh, to make this journey, and that's where they're, they're heading. They get up to Bethphage, or at least they're, it's right out ahead of them, and they're really at the peak overlooking Jerusalem. You can imagine the sight. What a beautiful sight. If you'd have been one of Jesus' disciples, to just look down over and see what was taking place down in Jerusalem. What does Jesus do? The Bible says, Matthew tells us that he sends two out. He says, all right, you see out ahead of you is the village. This is Bethphage. I want you to go out there. You're going to find a donkey and a colt. And I want you to untie them and bring them to me. If anybody says anything, uh, just let them know the Lord needs them. Everything will be fine. As we mentioned, um, Matthew is quoting Zechariah 9, 9. Let me read it for you. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Here it is. Righteous and victorious and lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Jesus sends them out to do that. Now, imagine you're one of the disciples being asked of Jesus to do this. What's the first thing you think of? Yes, Jesus, I'm going. Not me. I'm thinking probably what some of the disciples were when they're hearing this and the ones that are leaving. Jesus, you're asking us to go steal a donkey and a fowl, a colt. You're asking us to go steal them from somebody who needs them and they're their property. And Jesus like, you put it that way, no, no, that's not really what he said, but he said it a lot more eloquent. No, the Lord needs this. This is prophecy coming to play. Imagine today Jesus tells you to, hey, I need, see that Silverado over there? I need you to go and, and bring that to me. Now, we've talked about this. I told you which wires to put together, how to do that. It will start. If anybody says anything, it's for the Lord. The Lord needs it, right? It's kind of what is, is going on. It's like, seriously, this is not what you've taught us, but yet, yet they go, and they go and they bring that uh, donkey and the, the colt. All throughout, really, generations. People, and even today, people are looking for ways to discredit God, for ways to discredit the Bible. Maybe some of you struggle with some things as well. I know uh, growing up, even I grew up in a Christian home, gave my life to the Lord at an early age, and uh, just as I've grown, I've never really doubted, for, for, it's, it's by the grace of God, and I thank Him, but I've never really doubted who He was. Now, I've questioned how could things have happened, but it, it hasn't caused me to doubt that he is God and he is in control. We talked last week. I mean, some of the crazy things that we read in Scripture, right? The birth of Jesus through a virgin. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. God created people. He can do what he wants, right? I mean, can a person be swallowed by a big fish? I mean, God created fish. He can do what he wants with them. Can, can Jesus walk on water? He created water. He wants to walk on his water. He can do what he wants, right? So I, I, I don't always understand it, but it, for for bless the Lord, praise the Lord, it's not really allowed me to question my faith. But some people really struggle. And here's one of the areas where they do. You see, Matthew's the only gospel writer that mentions two animals, the colt and the donkey. You go to Mark, Luke, and John, there's just mention of one. So the question is, well, wait a minute, it contradicts. The answer is absolutely not. Again, God is using the perspective of four to bring the whole story together. Think about this for a second. You're at, uh, at home Thursday evening. You invite two of your friends over to the house. I'm a guy. I invited two of my guy friends, right? So I invite Tyler and Braden over to my house on a Thursday night. They come over the next day, Friday. I'm at work, and one of my coworkers, we're talking together and say, oh, yeah, hey, I had Braden over at my house last night. Now, am I lying to him? I didn't mention Tyler. You see how it all works? It's kind of silly, right? Well, that's how some people will look at the Bible and say it's discredited. It's contradictory. No. Both were there. Matthew, in his writing, he was a a disciple, witnessed a lot of this, if not all of it. He included both. The next thing that you may be struggling with is something I question, like, all right, he brought both of them. They're putting cloaks and things on both of these animals, and how did Jesus ride both of them into Jerusalem? I mean, I know Jesus is crazy, but that would have looked kind of weird, riding two animals at the same time. Kind of silly, right? But a lot of people discredit the Bible because of stuff like that. 
No, no, Jesus didn't ride both. Most likely, some people say he could have switched off. But we read in one of the other Gospels, the colt was never ridden. Right? So if you've ever been around horses and one that's never been ridden, you've got to take it lightly and be careful, right? And so what they would have done here is they would have put him on the colt, as the other Gospels mention, and the donkey mom would have been walking beside to bring comfort to the colt, right? Most likely how that would have transpired. But again, just seeing the big picture, and that's the beauty of the Gospels, they're bringing it from four different perspectives. So we see that the disciples do exactly what Jesus asked, and now they're getting ready to enter Jerusalem, and this is where I want us to camp out for a little bit. As they're coming down that hillside, moving towards Jerusalem, I want you to picture this. Many historians believe that there were a million, if not more, maybe up to two and a half million people all around this area. Jerusalem, the surrounding road getting in there. Can you visualize this? Now, they needed many of them. They knew most of them, if not all of them, knew that as Jews, you need to pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover, and you needed to be there. Some people came from miles and miles and days. Uh, Many people were there because they knew of this Jesus, this king, this person who's been doing some crazy things, saying some crazy things, and he's going to be there, and I want to see this. Many people had witnessed some of the things that he was talking about. Some people heard firsthand, secondhand, or even saw Jesus perform miracles. I mean, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, probably were at least double that at each of those places, when you count men and children and others that might have been there. And they saw this, miracles. Jesus had raised people uh, who were sick and healed them. He raised people from the dead. Many of them, right in their backyard, Bethany knew what he did a few days ago when he raised Lazarus literally from the dead. Right? Lazarus, come forth. And here comes a dead man, dead man walking. Right? That's where that all came from. And he's walking out of the grave. Right? Jesus did this. And so no doubt there's more because of these things. Hey, we want to see this guy. Is he for real? Is he really who he says he is? They're shouting, imagine this. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. That's a messianic phrase. Hosanna, save us. Save us now, Jesus. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's another messianic phrase. Hosanna in the highest. As we mentioned, Matthew is referring back to Psalm 118. It says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. And it says people are taking their coats off, their cloaks, their, their, their robes, and they're laying them on the ground. They're cutting branches off of trees and putting them on the ground. I mean, just didn't even probably think twice. I was thinking about this. If I was there, most likely I would not have taken my coat off because I'm kind of possessive. Now, I'm getting better, but I'm really possessive of my stuff. I remember mom telling me, and I... I do remember some of this. Uh, I would get toys and trucks and things, and I would line them all up. They'd be all like perfectly lined up, and nobody could touch them. Nobody could touch them. I didn't even play with half of them, if not most of them. They just, I just wanted to line them up and make them look good, right? Anybody relate to this? Some of you still do that, right? Your cars are just perfectly in your driveway. Okay, so that's, that's what, but I was just kind of possessive. I'm getting a little bit better at this. So the thought of me taking my coat off for this guy And then putting it on the ground, it's going to get dirty. I keep my stuff clean. It's going to get dirty. And it's this animal, and not really a pleasant animal, it's going to be walking over it. I can't see myself doing that. But this is what what people were doing. And in moments notice, just throwing everything out there. All right, this is the scene. I want to take us to Luke. You have your finger in Luke 19. Jump to Luke chapter 19. We'll have it on the screen as well. But Luke chapter 19 gives us insight into something that the other Gospels do not. And I love that because it's something we can't miss. Let me set it up. So Jesus, they're just getting ready to enter into Jerusalem, right? And people are screaming. They're shouting, Hosanna, King of kings, Lord of lords. And what Luke does, what Matthew doesn't do, Matthew says all the, you know, he gives us the illusion that everybody around there in front of Jesus and behind is shouting Hosanna. Luke includes the disciples, almost for us to maybe believe that maybe the disciples are kind of leading this verbal charge, right? And as they're chanting and they're shouting, all of a sudden a couple of the Pharisees speak out to Jesus, and they're, 
a conversation ensues. That's a first, right? Jesus, teacher, rabbi, why don't you rebuke your disciples? Probably more of you need to rebuke your disciples, telling him what to do. Why? Because it's blasphemy in their eyes. What they're hearing is blasphemy. This is not, you should not allow this to happen, right? And Jesus gives one of the most, most famous quotes in all of Scripture. He had a lot of them, didn't he? What did Jesus say? If they are quiet, then even the rocks must cry out. Even the rocks will cry out. I would love to have been present for some of these interactions with Jesus. And just like, what was their, what's their facial expression? So many times these people thought they had him. <laughs> yeah. They planned it in their mind. They did all the, the work. They probably had their little office and the schematics and everything and what they're going to say. And, well, we got him this time. And then Jesus says something like that. And you're like, oh, darn it, he did it again. Oops, he did it again. That's where she got that, that song from. I mean, right? I mean, just he, he blows their mind again. And here's another example. And look what Luke says in uh, what he tells us in chapter 19, verse 41. It says, He, Jesus, approached Jerusalem, and he saw the city, and he wept over it. Jesus said, If you even knew, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not have one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Triumphal entry, joyous time. And yet we read it wasn't so triumphant for one person, Jesus. Because as he looked at this town, he looked at the people. Luke says he began to cry. He began to weep. Why? Because he saw their hearts. The beauty of the relationship we have with God, he sees what we can't, and nobody else can. Yeah, that stuff comes out, and it will, but he sees deep into the heart of us. We think we can hide, not from him. Never. He sees it all. He saw the hearts of the people. He saw the misguidedness. He saw the attitudes the self-righteousness. He saw the hate. He saw all of that. He saw what was coming. And just years later, 70 AD, when the Romans would come and overthrow the temple and they would be in captivity again, he saw all of that, and yet he knows God will have his way. And so Jesus was weeping, not so triumphant for him. And then they go into... Jerusalem. Jesus saw the hearts of the people and it broke his. When we say that we put Jesus or they put Jesus on the cross, it's true. They did, we did, all of us, as Jesus hung on that cross, we celebrate this week. We put him there. So, what changed? So often we see Jesus, we see him for maybe who he is, but we also see him for what we want him to be. And the question that was, they were wrestling with, which this is what Jesus saw, is that, and you saw in that video, and it was so beautifully depicted, they knew what they wanted. They knew what they wanted in a king, but they didn't know what they needed. And it broke Jesus. Jesus. And so often it's the same for us. We think we know what we need, but we really don't. God's saying, no, I, I know what you need. And it becomes a control issue, right? Back and forth. So what we need to battle today, as we bring, kind of bring some application, what I want us to be challenged with is, are we willing to continue to do things our way or we allow God to do it his are we continually do it the way we want to do it, or are we going to say, you know what, God, no, I'm going to let you have it. Do it your way. You see, in our world, it's really about us, isn't it? We want things done our way. I uh, have kind of, I'm kind of excited about this, but I'm doing a lot better in my fast food uh, endeavors. 
nice segue, right? Well, hang with me. So uh, trying to stay away from fast food is just, it's, it's not doing anything for me, obviously, other than it tastes good sometimes. So trying to stay away from that. But it, it's interesting, the battle that goes on in the fast food industry. Always trying to one-up the other. You know, I'm a little partial to Chick-fil-A for a variety of reasons, but that is what it is. But for years, maybe from the beginning of fast food industry, I don't know, McDonald's has kind of been the, the, the blueprint, right? Everybody's trying to catch them. And back in the early 70s, Burger King was determined we are going to do everything we can to pass Burger King or pass McDonald's. We want to be better than them in every way. And so they developed a slogan called, have it your way. Some of you remember this. It's still happening today. They still use it today. But it's a slogan that they thought, boy, if this thing really catches on, uh, it's going to propel us right up to McDonald's or maybe blow right by McDonald's. And so they, they had a commercial. And this is one of the first commercials they came up with back in 1974. And I wanted to show it to you this morning. Take a look. Have it your Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Oh, well, in that case, could I have the other Whopper with extra ketchup? Sure. We can serve your grilled beef Whopper fresh with everything on top of any way you your way. Now that's the way to do things, our way. Have it your way, have it your way at Burger King, at Burger King. Yeah, our commercials have come a long way, right? All right, so who is willing to admit they remember that commercial? Yeah, yeah, look around. The generation gap is evident, right? I don't know, how did the lady come up with those songs so quick? All right, beautiful. We need to go back to those hats, too. But that, um, that song, that, that slogan is still present today. If you watch a, a commercial from Burger King today, you can Google it, even this year. They, they'll end with that, uh, have it your way. But then there's one other tagline they throw in at the very, very end. Two words. Anybody know what it is? It's like emphatic. I throw the fist pump into it. At the end of it, have it your way, it's like, you rule. Anybody know that? Right, I don't, there's no fist pump. I just add that part. I should get royalty for that. But it's like this, this energy, you rule. Have it my way. I rule. Isn't that kind of where we're at as a country, as a world? It's our way. Have it our way. We rule. It's our, our will, our, our way, our needs. It's kind of basically become an unofficial amendment to the American Bill of Rights. We rule. Nearly 2,000 years ago, people lined the streets, roughly two, two and a half million people, to see somebody come in that they already had a preconceived notion of who they should be. Jesus, I need you to do this for me. I need it my way. I rule. So do things the way I need to see it, and everything will be good. And yet, as we get into Passover week, Holy Week, it's the fact that Jesus refused to be forced into other people's ideas of who he should be. Is anybody happy for that? Are you thankful for that today? He refused. He refused, but yet so many of us today find ourselves being molded by things that we watch, hear, see, you know, a part of, people that we're around, you know, what we see on Netflix, YouTube, movies, what lyrics that we hear in music, the people that are around us, we're molded into what maybe they want us to be or who we think we should be. And sometimes we don't even know it. We don't even realize it. But yet Jesus never did that. His identity, as we saw in the beginning of Matthew, his identity was rooted in God the Father. His will, his life, everything he did. How else could he sit there on that mountain that day before he was arrested, praying with such vigor and such enthusiasm and such pain and agony that his, his sweat was like blood? And what did he say? God, if you can take this cup from me, do it. Do it. But Jesus knew who he was. He knew his identity. He knew what was re required of him and in the same breath. This is fully God, fully man. Jesus, he says, no, not my will. You see what he modeled for us? It wasn't his. It's not his way. 
It's not, oh, I rule, God, I'm going to do it my way. No, he said, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew what he had to do. We struggle with that today. So as we kind of apply this, what can we learn from this uh, event? Really two things. Two things that I want to throw at you, and we'll kind of bring it together. You take a note this morning. The first point is this. Having it our way with Jesus implies we get to define his rule in our lives. That's what we're doing. If we want him, if we want to, to rule our lives or, or we want to have it our way, we're saying to Jesus, okay, I'm going to fit you in this box the way I see you fit. You're going to, got to do it the way I want you to, to do it. This is exactly what was happening in that day as those people were welcoming him in. And I really, really want to look at five things, and there's maybe more, but really five rules, if you will, that these people were, were wanting Jesus to fulfill or, or five rules that he already uh, fit into in their eyes, right? There could be more. Let's list them. The first one is this, teacher. They wanted him to be a teacher. Now, Jesus was a great teacher, wasn't he? I mean, many times he was welcomed as teacher, rabbi, but he was an excellent, he was the best teacher. Right? Nobody had better illustrations than Jesus. Nobody brought the everything together like Jesus. Nobody finished a message like Jesus, and I can go on and on and on. He was the greatest teacher. Thousands saw him teach. When Jesus began to teach, people came. There were no billboards needed. There was no flashy signs. We did not need to hand out pamphlets on the street. When Jesus started to speak, people came and people listened. Lots of them. He was an amazing teacher. He brought great insight. He brought great wisdom. And that's what they wanted, nothing more. These people wanted him to just be teacher. Even today, we see that. We mold him into this box of just being a good teacher, just being a moral people, moral person. And many people, that's their vision or view of Jesus. He was a good teacher. Others that were there saw him as a conformist, conforming him into what they wanted him to be. This was a constant challenge for Jesus, wasn't it? We saw this so often with these know-it-alls, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the scribes, constantly trying to back Jesus into a wall. Again, just I would have loved to be there for some of these conversations. Jesus, you healed on the Sabbath. Are you kidding me? Do you know not what it says here? Do you need me to read it to you, Rabbi? Jesus, this person, she committed adultery. You know what it says in Deuteronomy 22. Do you need me to read it, Jesus? No, I think I got it. Well, then give us the word. We got stones, we're going to start chucking them. We're ready to go. What did Jesus say? Any of you not sin? We got any perfect people out here? I got a stone for you. Go ahead. You throw the first one. I, I added a little bit of green leaf to that, but you get the point, right? They're constantly challenging him. Luke 19, we just read it. Jesus, do you realize what they're saying? It's blasphemy. Rebuke them, master. I doubt they even said that. Probably just the rebuke them part. It was constantly wanting him to be conformed into who he should be in their eyes. We do that today, don't we? We have ideas of Jesus, just do, do this, well, everything will be fine. Just do this for me, God, and we're all good. We'll all be on good terms. It's around our wants, our desires. He was a teacher to some, conformist. Others wanted him to be a revolutionist why they were so confused when they saw Jesus coming. Two million or more people are lined up waiting for Jesus and his entourage to come marching down the hill with the big stallion and people guns a-blazing. Yeah, here we go. Bring it on. The dude's on a donkey. Bartholomew, you catching this? Jimmy, do you see? I don't know. He's riding a donkey. That's not too scary. Now, praise God, Revelation tells us he will come back on a white horse. But not this time. He rode in on a donkey. He was to be a conquering king. He was to take the Roman government out. And he came as the Prince of Peace, symbolizing humility. Zechariah prophesied it. Humility, servanthood. He would be the sacrificial lamb. That's our Jesus. That's not what people wanted. We do that today. 
We want him to be our leader. We want, him, we want Jesus to make people pay. We want God, hey, look what they have done to us. Look how they've treated us. You need to make them pay. Our revolutionists, and closely tied to that, others saw him as a disciplinarian. He's supposed to uh, come and overthrow the government. He's supposed to rebuke people. He's supposed to, people that aren't following the law, people that aren't doing what they should do, he needs to discipline them, condemn them, rebuke them, put them in time out, go into the corner, whatever you gotta do, make them do chores. Jesus was the ultimate uh, disciplinarian, and that's what they wanted from him. Punish sinners, punish the guilty, the immoral. This guy's bothering me, Jesus. He's been, God, he's been tormenting me for years at work. Will you take care of him for me? I just do something. Make him suffer, make him pay. He deserves it. She deserves it. Jesus, you need to be my disciplinarian. That's who you're supposed to be. Jesus didn't do that, didn't he? Did he? He, he loved the unrighteous. Can you imagine sometimes the disciples watching him, some of the people he was around, up on that hillside at the well that day with that prostitute. Can you imagine them like, what is he doing? We're not supposed to hang around people like that. Peter, you're kind of like the spokesman. Go say something, will you please? This uh, Friday, for Good Friday, we're going to have a Seder table out here, and it's going to be just a beautiful picture of, of uh, what takes place for, for Jews all across the planet during Holy Week, and others of you participate in that sometimes as well. And what is so beautiful about the Seder, the Passover, is that every single thing points back to Jesus. Everything points back to Jesus. And during a Seder, at one point, uh, the leader will um, talk about, you know, it all goes back to, to Exodus as well and being reminded of what happened there and how we were oppressed and in slavery and let out of that and freed, right? And they will then list and pray over and sometimes scripture over each of the 10 plagues that God put on the Egyptians. You know, each one of those plagues represents a God that they worshiped at that time. There were many of them, hundreds if not thousands of them. And each one of those 10 plagues represents a God that the Egyptians had, lowercase g. God in all of that wanted them to see that I am the one true God. And even in Exodus chapter 7 and other places if where God wanted them not only to see that he is the one true God, but he wanted to be their God as well. Even the last one, the horrific um, uh, uh, picture of, of firstborns being killed. And there's, there's so much to that as well. But God through that, showing them that I am the one true God. Jesus is representative of this. I am the one who will save you. I love you that much. I care for you that much. They wanted him to be disciplinarian. And then others, still others, wanted him to be some kind of wonder worker. Why? Because they've seen it and they heard about it. They heard about all of his magic acts and when's the next one? Are we going to see the next trick? I don't know if you have cards under that cloak, Jesus, but we can't wait. What are you going to do next? And even more importantly, how's it going to benefit me? What's, it going to, what, what's in it for me? You know, some people had seen this. Some had heard of it. Again, many were there because of what just took place in Bethany. You raised Lazarus from the dead. Oh, my goodness, how did that happen? Can you do something else like that? Show me the next miracle. That's a big struggle for us sometimes because if we don't see Jesus doing that in our lives and it's visible, is he even present? And this is tough. We've talked about this before in James. We see where it says if you're sick and you're in need of prayer, come and let the elders pray over you and, and, and anoint you with oil. And God hears your prayers. There's no magic formula in the oil. It's just following scripture. It's Jesus who saves, Jesus who heals. God is still a God of miracles. And we see that happen. We've seen miracles in this church, people healed in this church family. And some of you have seen that in other um, situations as well. But what if he does not? What if it doesn't work out the way we think it should work out? Is he still God? And so what happens, so often we don't see this, but we think we deserve that. We deserve abundance. God, we deserve wealth. We deserve things to go well. And when they're going well, everything's good. But how quickly things can change. 
And all of a sudden, things aren't going so well, and we just kind of turn our back. And we start walking away. And then it's like, well, God, where are you? Well, he didn't go anywhere. We're the ones who walked. We're the ones who left. God is always with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And that's exactly what's happening there. People are screaming for a variety of reasons, but it's joyful. Hosanna, save us, save us now. Taking their coats off, throwing them on the ground, cutting branches, throwing them on the ground. And yet, in just a couple days, they would go from cheering and smiles to violent anger and screams of crucify him, crucify him. What happened? As quickly as we can be singing his praises, we can be upset and mad, and in this case, even shouting at him. So the question for us is, we continue to allow ourselves to rule and imply meaning putting him in places that wherever we feel he fits? Or our second point, do we realize that a relationship with Jesus emphatically means letting him have his way? Sometimes easier said than done, but we need to let him have his way. The beauty of what we see in this story, go back to when Jesus commands and tells his two disciples to go out. Yeah, they're thinking, well, how's this going to play out? I'm stealing these this other guy's animals. But what do we see? An incredible truth here is that God is always ahead of us. He's always working for our good. Jesus knew exactly how that was going to play out. The disciples, those two guys, didn't see it. Even the other guys that are standing around probably didn't understand it. But God is always working ahead for our good. When we follow him and we serve him and we allow his purposes to reign in our life, have any of you seen, you don't have to raise your hand, but seen the, the video series, I Am Second? I Am Second. It's a really awesome um, organization. They started this, I don't know how long ago, years ago, and a series of videos, there's probably hundreds of them out now, and they're really stories of redemption, stories of people who were just living for themselves and caught in addictions and all kinds of things, and then Jesus gets a hold of them and they give their life to him and they just see the transformation that took place. That's what a relationship with Jesus is. It's transformation, starting in the heart and going outward, right? And as it often happens, I can get down rabbit trails and two minutes turns into many minutes north of two minutes. And so I, I got in the I Am Second and watched one of the videos, and next thing I know, you know, a seven, eight minute video turned into an hour and a half and there I go. Well, I got um, moved into a, a section of I Am Second videos from Duck Dynasty. I remember that series that was out, right? Uh, the Robertsons down in West Monroe, Louisiana and the duck calls and uh, it's turned into one duck call into a multi-million dollar business. But if you never knew the story of just how God has worked in the life of that family, it's phenomenal. I encourage you to watch these videos. There was eight of them. Uh, documenting several different people in the family, even a grandson. Uh, the first one, though, is the patriarch, Phil Robertson. You know, he, uh, just paraphrase quickly, uh, had a great career possibly in the NFL. He was a quarterback with Terry Bradshaw in college. He was the starter. Bradshaw was the backup uh, for you Pittsburgh Steeler fans. Uh, and he just didn't want to do it anymore. He wanted to go home, and they found uh, he was already dating his wife, Miss Kay, and then they got married. And, but alcoholism and adultery and all these things ruled his life. He had opportunities at times to, to, to talk about the Lord, but he, he threw it all away. And I think he had, he had four sons. I think three of them were born when uh, he had another adulterous affair. And uh, a lady, a daughter came out of that, which now they've met. They're together. She lives near him, I guess. And just a beautiful, again, reconciliation, how God's brought all that together. But he was so bad that he, he, he kicked his family out, essentially. They, they left for a, for a time. But God was still in it. And again, long story short, a, a pastor um, just was able to talk to him, and he heard the gospel in a way that he never heard it before. And he questioned, like, Jesus came for me. Jesus did that for me. Jesus died on a cross for me. And it began to make sense to him. And so he, he prayed and with his kids watching, his wife watching, and tears coming down their eyes as he prayed to receive Jesus, and later he was baptized. And then he purposed to start living for God. 
Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? For all of us. Jesus is Savior, but I still want some control. But when he becomes Lord, we start living for him in a posture of trust that his will will get done. And he promises will come to fruition like he says they will. He, t- he shares about reading Ma- uh, uh, Romans chapter 12. I encourage you to go back and read it. I don't particularly like it, but <laughs> it's a good chapter. It starts out good. Don't conform to the patterns of this world. I get it. No problem. But then Paul ups the ante. Bless those who persecute you. Yeah, that's not fun. Don't return evil for evil. Oh, come on. They throw a right hook at me. I'm kicking and screaming. I mean, right? Come on. And Phil remembers I'm reading that and like, oh boy. This is, this is hard. You know what? I'm going to give it a try. Down in the south, he tells us there's rednecks and there's river rats. River rats take it to a whole new level. They will steal stuff from you and not even think twice. And so for years, his living was catching fish. The duck calls weren't there yet. The millions of, of orders and now dollars were not there yet. And so he's making a living by uh, catching fish, fish, selling fish. And these river rats will go up and down. He had a, his, a lot of property, would go up and down the river, his, essentially his river, I guess, and take his nets, all the fish, and put them back in and leave. And so he's looking at this, and typically what he would do is get in his boat, take his gun, and hold the gun and say, take one more fish, see what happens, essentially. This time, he's like, I'm reading Romans 12, and I'm like, this makes no earthly sense to me, God, but I'm going to try it. Why? Because you said it. What's he doing? He said, I'm going to trust you. He's looking through the trees, and they're out there on the boat. They're pulling one of his nets up. He gets in the boat. He grabs his gun because he said, I'm not going to use it, but if they use theirs, I just want to be prepared. He didn't know what was going to happen. He gets out there and up to it, and they're denying everything. What's this? Yeah, that's a net, dum-dum. You know what that is. That's my net, my fish. But he says, here's what I'm going to do. He says, whatever you pull up out of that water, I'm going to let you have every one of them. To which he's like, they're looking dumbfounded. Like, are you kidding me? What? And they do a lot of fish dumping in their boat. They start down the river. They're looking back at him. And he says, you know what happened? They never took one more fish from my nets again. And he's like, God, you must be right. Your your word must be true. You you see what's happening? It's that trust. God, and don't we, we know a couple people that trusted him, don't we? Joseph, Mary, God, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. It makes no human sense. But by golly, I'm going to trust you. These are teenagers. Man, what we learn from teenagers, right? Moms, dads, learn from your kids. God's always ahead of us. Here's the second thing. Our expectations are not always what God has planned. We need to wrap our heads around that. Our expectations are not always what God has planned. Someone once told me, the greater your expectations, the worse you feel when they are not met. Sometimes our expectations of God are of such that he's probably just thinking, no, no, you're missing it. And then when they don't get met by him, well, okay, he's not a good God. He's not there for me. He doesn't love me anymore, if he even did it all. Is it okay if our expectations are not met by God? Is it maybe he has something else for us? Is it possible he sees something we don't see? Is it possible he loves us so much he is protecting us from something that we have no idea we need to protect it from. Wrap this up. Somebody say amen. Matthew 21, verse 10. We read this earlier as he went into Jerusalem. People are cheering and things, and others are asking a question. I want to ask you this this morning. It's afternoon now. They said, who is this? Who is this? What if you were standing there beside one of the people that were asking that question? What would you have said? Who is this guy? What if you're sitting beside somebody this morning that's desperately asking that question and you've never answered it? What if you rub shoulders with somebody at work that's been asking that in so many different ways, subtly, for years, and you've never even given them an answer? Who is Jesus to you? And does your life reflect your image of who he is in your life? Who is he? How do you answer that this morning? In Luke, again, 19, you remember what Jesus said to those Pharisees that day? Rebuke them, Jesus. What did he say? If they're quiet, then the rocks will shout out. Church, can we not give the rocks a chance to shout out today? 
we not give inanimate objects the chance to shout when Acts 1-8 tells us to be God's hands and feet? Are we who God has created us to be? Are, are, are our words reflective of that? Are, is our body language, our way we do handle things, uh, the way we live life reflective of that? Is our prayer life reflective of that? Are we his hands and feet? Are we worshiping him every day? Is he our all? Is he the Lord of our life? Some of us have received Jesus as Savior, but we're still trying to, we're still trying to do it our way. Here's a great quote I came across this week from D.L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody. He says, we're told to let our lights shine, and if it does, we won't need to tell anybody it does. Lighthouses don't fire cannons to call attention to their shining. They just shine. Isn't that awesome? Our lights need to shine for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As we close our service, as we've been doing, I think it's so important to just take a moment I just want to have you all where you're at, at home, wherever you are, just take a moment and just allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. Are you holding on to one area of your life? Do you need to give it to Him? God, I need you. Speak it out. Say it to Him. God, I need you to have control of this. Maybe it's everything. Maybe it's a certain area. God, I need you to be Lord of this area. I need you to be Lord of my life. Now, if you've never received Jesus as Savior, then that's where it has to start. None of this makes sense until Jesus comes in and saves you of what you can't save yourself. There's only one way to heaven is through relationship with Jesus, not multiple ways as other people or maybe religions will tell you. There's only one. Jesus himself made it clear. So in this moment, maybe you just welcome Jesus to come in and save you of your sins and begin a new relationship with him. For others, it's a matter of allowing him to be Lord now. I put you in this box. I framed you a certain way. I'm done. The box is gone, Jesus. I need you to be Lord of it all. I do trust you. And your word will come to fruition. I'm going to follow your word. It won't be easy. We were never promised that. Allow him to speak to you. Would you do that in these next couple moments? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we can't continue to have you be who we want you to be. We will continue to spiral and spin out of control. Oh, Jesus, we need you to be Lord. We need you to have control. We want you to be in charge. God, that is an incredible leap of faith for us but it is needed. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to have such a desire for you each and every day. We can't start our day without you. We can't end our day without you, and we can't go through the day without you. Give us more of your Holy Spirit. May that be a prayer on our hearts each and every day. Father, I need to be being filled. I need more of your Spirit in my life. That power, strength, conviction that comes with it. Leading, guiding. Father, I pray for those that are struggling, needing control. Lord, give them the ability to let it go to relinquish it to you, to lay it at your feet, to lay it at the foot of your cross. They may experience freedom in a way they've maybe never experienced before. Whatever it is right now, Lord, just may they give it to you. That's why you went to that cross, to take all of those burdens on, on your shoulders. We need not live with them. 
Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you. God's people said, amen, amen. If you're able, would you stand as we close our service? I encourage you to, if you need to continue to pray to do that, I'd love to pray with you. I'll be here at the end of the service. Others would love to pray as well. Don't feel you got to rush out of here. I will say just a couple quick things as we close. We got some prayer happening before each of the services. Would love you to be part of that. First service, connections room, people praying. Uh, in between services, connection room, group of people praying. Uh, just awesome to see them praying for the service and whatever the Holy Spirit lays on their heart. Love you to be part of that. If you're really hungry, which many of you probably are, we got a, a, a kind of a snack to get you ready for lunch. Burritos happening out there for the youth. Get out and grab one kind of tie you over. It won't fill you up unless you eat six or seven of them, but you're welcome to do that as well. But that's out in the lobby, all right? Lord, thank you for just who you are. Thank you, Lord, for this service. Thank you for what we celebrate. And as we move into Holy Week, Lord, we just praise you for what you did for us that we couldn't do on our own. Look forward to what you're going to teach us throughout this Easter season. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday.